For almost a century, San Quentin's death row has housed the most nefarious individuals from the state of California. In 1988, around 20 to 30 death row inmates belonged to the Crips gang alone. That year, a group of them faced severe punishment after Taekwon Lil Fee Cox, a member of the Rolling Sixties Crips, stabbed another inmate in the neck with a four and a half inch blade. His target, Stanley Tookie Williams, a founding figure of the Crips. Two separate heinous mass homicides had landed both men on San Quinn's death row. This is the story of how two of the most notorious Crips in LA clashed within the walls of San Quinn. Today, I'm excited to offer you the chance to become a part of the channel's journey in a whole new way. Through Gigastar, you can now own a portion of this channel's AdSense revenue. This is open to fans 18 and older, and it's a government-regulated, legally binding offering under regulation crowdfunding. As an investor, you'll automatically receive a payment every month based on the AdSense revenue the channel generates. Plus, we've got some special perks lined up for you, like early access to new uploads, post video credits, and a free 58-page ebook. Gigastar is even planning a secondary market, so you could potentially buy and sell in the future. Like any investment, risk is always involved, including loss. But if you're confident in this channel's future and want to support, head over to Gigastar and create an account now. I can't discuss the terms and conditions here, so click the link in the description to see all the details. Thank you for your continued support. Let's grow this channel together. In the 1940s, black gangs first spawned in LA and spread south and west by the 50s and 60s. In the late 60s, Raymond Washington, a fabled street fighter, sought to unite these gangs under one banner. He clicked up with Stanley Tookie Williams, another feared street fighter and bodybuilder known citywide. However, not all the gangs fell in line, and those that didn't form the rival Bloods gang. And by the 70s, the robbery led to escalating gunplay. The violence surged on through the decade, and Tookie became a victim himself. While recovering from a 1976 drive-by shooting, Tookie redeveloped an addiction to PCP, a mind-altering drug otherwise known as SHRM. It helped him deal with the stress of living a double life. By day, Tookie worked as a counselor in boys' homes, urging them to ditch the gang life and preaching the virtues of bodybuilding. But by night, he was a PCP-filled menace that made a reputation for beating and robbing drug dealers. By the end of the decade, the gang life would take both Raymond and Tookie off the streets for good. After five years in prison, Raymond was mysteriously murdered on a street corner in August 1979, shortly after his release. As for Tookie, 1979 would be his last year on the streets as well, after his drug-fueled capers came to a head. On a late Tuesday evening on February 28, 1979, a 24-year-old Tookie, Darrell, Alfred Blackie Coward, and Tony Sims were plotting a robbery. They pulled up to a 7-Eleven where the 26-year-old clerk, Albert Lewis Owens, was sweeping the parking lot. When the crew rolled up, unaware of the threat, Owens left his cleaning tools behind and went inside to serve them. As Darrell and Sims moved toward the cash register, Tookie slipped behind Owens, pulled a shotgun from under his jacket, and coldly told Owens to shut up and keep walking. He marched Owens to the back room where he allegedly shot out the CCTV and shot Owens twice in the back as he lay on the floor. The next chapter in the robbery spree unfolded on March 11, 1979 at the Brookhaven Motel in South Central LA, a motel run by an immigrant Taiwanese family, the Yangs. A 76-year-old father, his 63-year-old wife, their 43-year-old daughter, and their son Robert. At around 5 a.m. that day, Tookie stormed into the motel lobby and smashed his way into the private office. There, he allegedly executed father, wife, and daughter at close range. Their son Robert woke up to the sound of a scream and the gunshots and rushed over to find the massacre and an empty cash register. On March 15th, Tookie and a friend were pulled over and the cops found a double barrel shotgun in the trunk. At the station, Tookie's friend was questioned on their role in the two robberies and four murders, and he gave up Tookie. Tookie's trial drew widespread attention, painting a chilling portrait of his ruthlessness. Evidence piled up against him, and the horror of his actions were laid bare for the court. On March 31, 1981, 
Tookie Williams was convicted of all four murders and both robberies and was sentenced to death. Tookie denied his involvement in the murders until his death. Around the same time, another name was rising up the ranks in the Crips, Tyquan Cox, better known as Lil Fee. Lil Fee came from a broken home and was largely abandoned and unsupervised in the streets of South Central. By his teens, Fee had pledged allegiance with the Rolling Sixties Crips, one of the Crips factions. He grew a reputation as a fearless shooter. In the early morning hours of August 31st, 1984, both armed, Fee and Darren Williams entered the house of former NFL player Kermit Alexander's mother, Abora Alexander, on 59th Street in LA. Down the street, three others, Horace Burns, Ida Moore, and Lisa Brown sat in a van, keeping a lookout. A few minutes later, Fee and Williams were back in the getaway vehicle, having killed Ibora while she sat at her kitchen table. Her 25-year-old daughter, 12 and 6-year-old grandsons, all while they slept. They separated, and later that night, they left for a spot called the Vermont Club to collect payment for the hit. After, Lil Fee, who had the murder weapon wrapped in a jacket, took it to a friend's apartment, James Kennedy. He instructed him to wash the jacket and get rid of the rifle but Kennedy wanted to keep the gun and crucially held on to it. Lil Fee bought a Cadillac for 3,000 the same day. The case stayed cold for a month until the cops made a breakthrough when they arrested James Kennedy for narcotics. He gave up Lil Fee and gave them the murder weapon he had held on to. Trial testimony revealed that the Alexander family wasn't the real target. Lil Fee had been hired by Ossie Diamond Jack Jackson, the owner of a local club, to deal with the problem Valerie Taylor, a young woman who had filed a lawsuit against him after getting shot and paralyzed at his club. Taylor lived just two doors down from Kermit's mother, but the near illiterate Fee and his crew got the address wrong. During the hit, there was a brief tussle between Fee and Kermit Alexander's 14-year-old nephew, Neil, who ran off and survived. Another 13-year-old grandson hid in a closet and survived. It would also be revealed that Kermit Alexander had known Lil Fee as a kid, when he coached his little league team. He remembered him as being angry and combative. During the trial, Fee's defense attorney spoke of his client's upbringing, highlighting how he was abused and abandoned at an early age by his mother, who was a drug addict and prostitute. Growing up in a neighborhood where violent street gangs ruled the blocks, it was sink or swim. But despite the efforts to show Fee as a product of his environment, the cold reality of his choices couldn't be overlooked. On February 28, 1986, after just three days of deliberation, the jury handed 18-year-old Tyquan Cox the death penalty. He was sent to the same facility as Tookie. At first, Tookie and Lil Fee were cool in prison, especially since both were heavy into bodybuilding. But their camaraderie quickly turned sour when Tookie gave Fee an order he couldn't bring himself to follow. Tookie ordered Fee to take out Darren Williams, also a crip who was on death row for his part in the Alexander family murders. Word had reached Tookie that Darren might have been planning on informing, so he immediately wanted him out of the picture. To Tookie's surprise, Fee flatly refused. This sparked a power struggle in San Quentin. Before this incident, most inmates on death row had been known to set aside their beef. They knew that any infraction would hurt their chances of getting retried or their sentences being overturned on appeal but Lil Fee seemingly didn't have the same foresight. October 10, 1988, while Tookie was walking outside in the exercise yard, he stabbed him in the neck with a four and a half inch blade. From a gun tower, an officer ordered everyone on the yard to the ground, and Fee tossed his weapon onto the basketball court. The officers rushed to Tookie, who was bleeding out, and when they asked what happened, Tookie said, I don't know what happened, I don't remember. Despite the grave injury, Tookie survived. After the attack, prison officials put more than a dozen Crip members and associates on death row to grade B status, cutting off their privileges and limiting their exercise time to just 10 hours a week. For his own protection, Fee was isolated in his own exercise yard with one other inmate. Tookie, on the other hand, gradually reinvented himself as a reformed man on a new mission and shifted his focus to fighting for a reduced sentence. He also started writing children's books that preached against gang violence and his efforts even earned him a nomination for a Nobel Peace Prize. His case split the public into two camps, those who believe he genuinely changed 
and those who doubted his sincerity. Despite all efforts and appeals for clemency, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger upheld Tookie's death sentence. On December 13, 2005, after refusing a last meal, making no apologies, and having no last words, Stanley Tookie Williams was executed by lethal injection. As for Lil Fee, he tried to make a run for it in July 2000, five years before Tookie's execution, with two other inmates, Paul Tuiapea and Noel Jackson, also convicted murderers on death row. Fee made a desperate dash for freedom. They charged through a hole they pried open in a chain link fence, hoping to grab some hostages along the way. But the escape turned into a chaotic mess, and after a rough tussle, the guards managed to wrangle all three back into a secure yard. Their botched getaway left the officers scrambling to tackle the serious security flaws dog in San Quentin. Today, Fee still remains in San Quentin, still on death row.